Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is Tara Smith, the professor of philosophy at the University of Texas at Austin. She is the author of numerous books, including the new book, Judicial Review and Objective Legal System, from Cambridge University Press. Welcome to Free Thoughts. Good to be here. Thanks. Your book is about judicial review, but but before you get to judicial review, you have to you get through a lot of other yeah. things in the beginning, um, and you start more foundationally, about as foundationally as you possibly can start, which is the the nature of reality, essentially, and, and objectivity, and you call it getting reality right. So, can you talk a little about what what objectivity is in your view, and why it's important to start with sure. it in a book of legal philosophy? And yeah, yeah, I think that's really important. Why should we care about objectivity in in a book about judicial review, which is about how should judges interpret, understand, apply the law, right? Well, I, I didn't set out to – and I didn't originally envision I would really go into objectivity when I was interested in that subject of judicial review. But verge, for all the disagreeing schools about how should judges do their work, uh, virtually everybody agrees judges should uphold the law, you know, objectively uphold the law. But they have very different understandings of what that means, of what objective law is. And at the same time, even while we, you know, we know a decision when we don't like it, people from all different ideological stripes, you know, we know a decision whether it be a court decision when we don't like it or a personal decision. They gave her a raise and they passed me over, whatever, right? We're quite ready to say that wasn't objective, that was bias, that was prejudiced. At the same time, a lot of people go around saying nobody can be objective. We're all biased, right? Everybody's prejudiced and so on. Well, if we really are serious about objective law, the objective rule of law, no, there's something that judges should be upholding and there is a proper way to do it, then I think we have to tackle objectivity itself dead on. So part of what I try to do in the chapter is you might say puncture the mystique of objectivity. Because I think it's one of these concepts that's a little bit intimidating for people. So they feel like, well, you know, I make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. How could we possibly be objective? So I try to give an account of it that is realistic. It's such – I mean I paint objectivity in such a way that it is doable. It's demanding and it, it really is demanding. But there is a difference between being biased or indulging prejudices or going by irrelevant factors and so on. So that's more to speak to why I even ended up getting into this but I just thought it would be useful to tackle what is it to be objective and then we can from there try to trace out, OK, how does that apply in a legal system overall and then to the more specific domain of judicial review. Now you talk about uh, uh, Rand's concept of the primacy of existence um, which helps explain what object objectivity is as a I don't know if the right word is behavior as a, uh -huh. as a method uh -huh. of thinking, yes. uh -huh. which is not yes. which is a goal. Like not, you don't necessarily like always realize it. You try uh -huh. to get right. to it, and you should try. Uh -huh. I mean, that's what I'm saying. You should try to. Well, I think what you need to do to be objective is to, as you put it, and I put it this way in the book. Right, it's a method of thinking. It's a discipline for how to use your mind. So even though we sometimes speak of objective reality, strictly speaking, no reality just is it's a person who can be objective or non-objective. He can be lazy. He can indulge his prejudices or I don't feel like getting more evidence even though I know there's some counter evidence out there and so on. So I do see it very much as it's a way of directing and disciplining your mind such that you'll, as I put it in the book, get reality right. Or at least and, closer than uh, Well, right. Else. As well as you can get it, right? And and here my thinking is, look, let's step back a minute and again ask a question about why do we even care about objectivity in any realm? Again, in the decisions about who gets hired or promoted or gets the raise, who gets admitted to a school, who does the bank make a loan to? Is the journalist objective? Is the juror objective? Is the referee at the game last night? I mean there are all sorts of domains in, in which we think, oh, no, we want object. Why do we want it? There's some either conclusion to be drawn or decision to be made and we want it made for the right reasons. We want the drug researchers right, to tell us is the drug effective or not? Does the drug have these side effects? Or, right? There's something we want to get right. So that's a loose way of putting, yes, there's a reality. You know, there's, there's a certain kind of answer here. Objectivity as I portray it is a way of using your mind that it's the way of using your mind that is most conducive 
to getting the right answer. It doesn't guarantee that you'll get the right answer. But it is, I think, right. It puts you in the best position to know whereof you speak. So we're talking about objectivity for things like whether this drug is effective. That seems different. What you know, the, the underlying reality we're getting at is of a different sort than it is for the law in the sense that like the drug is – there's a physical thing. We can measure it. We can run an experiment. Yeah. But how would we know if we're getting – if we're being objective in things that are just kind of agreement among people about concepts? Because obviously there's enormous disagreement. Right. And so if we just based it on like, well, lots of people disagree with me so I've got it wrong. doesn't seem right. Or everyone agrees with me so I must have it right. We can think of lots of counterexamples. Right. Well, of course, if they agree with me, that's OK. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, no. I mean that's a – a good and perfectly natural question and you hear that kind of thing a lot. Look, it's one thing to talk about physical reality, drugs effect, safety of automobiles or so on, right? It's another to talk about objectivity in the realm of things you can't see, right? Like law or values and morality. But there too, I don't think we are I don't think the notion of objectivity even in the non-physical or non-material realm is so exotic at all. I mean think back to the example of who gets the raise or the promotion. Well, that's not – I mean that's not physically testable in the same way this chemical is as a drug, right? But there's a bit – a manager at work can make those decisions more or less objectively, right? He can pay attention to how the different employees, people under him, how they performed all year. And there are much more specific measures that everybody in business out there knows, right, of, you know, was he attentive? Did he meet deadlines? How did he deal with clients? How responsive was he? How creative were his ideas? I mean, there are specifics that are not material in the same way. You can't put them under the microscope, let's say, right? But I think we do that in a number of realms as well. So I, I, I think it's a little harder to do, but it's certainly doable and appropriate. And again, lots of the areas where we complain about non-objectivity are about you should be paying attention to this. It's hard – you know, it, it's harder in some realms. I mean, well, a lot more comes into it at the higher levels of abstraction. But I'm saying in principle, the same, the same aim or goal should be driving the quest to be – we want to get the best answers we can. We want to – promote the people who are capable of doing the work, who will deliver in that role. We want to admit students to the school who are capable of doing the work, who will maybe bring other things that we want to the student body and so on. So we have to identify what are the characteristics here, just as the biological researchers have to identify what are the characteristics we're looking for for this kind of therapy or drug. So with the example of picking the employee who should get the promotion or the raise, what is the this objective method getting at? Because again, like in the drug trials or when we're talking about like objectively looking at like say science looking at reality, there is – there's a reality and we can either understand it correctly or incorrectly and it's independent of us. But it feels like the who should get the promotion seems to have a level of – it's called like cultural embeddedness. Like we could say, you know, well, objectively the person who should get the promotion is the one who was the most productive. But we can imagine, you know, there have been lots of well, times when the person who should get the promotion is the one who is the most related to the ruler. You know, like right. it's, these are these are kind of culturally well, contingent things. Okay. No, no. And again, good, interesting question. I don't think it's a matter of what's culturally embedded, but I mean, you're you're right to ask what is it that we're trying to get after if it's not how this physical specimen will work, right? And I think the answer is going to depend on the specific, you know. What kind of company – if we're talking about hiring, promoting at a company, what kind of company is it? What's its main mission? Even all companies in the same sector, right? Some might have somewhat different missions. They're like are we there to maximize shareholder profit or are we there to make the best damn cell phone we can or whatever it might be, right? But I think it's the ultimate goal of the reason for which you're engaged in hiring people, promoting people in the first place. Let's switch just for a minute to the school analogy, right? What kind of school is it? Is it a religious institution that really cares very highly or maybe primarily about turning out good Baptists or good whatever, right? How high a value is that? How high a value is this sort of intellectual attainment or is, is a certain sort of socioeconomic diversity the goal of this school? Depending on what the goal is, I think that sets 
an awful lot then of, well, relative to that, these are the relevant pieces of evidence. These are irrelevant. So these object- are the weights that they should have comparatively and not. So, Is this yeah. objectivity then as a hypothetical imperative? A hypothetical imperative. If um, you want to do this, then you must no, do this. No, yeah. Um, in a it's sense, a Philip, I like suppose. A I mean there's a part of me that's just, oh, let's not talk that Kantian language. But um, even though obviously – it's the categorical imperative, but I mean that. But um, yes, I think in the sense that, as I said, if your goal is this, if your goal is that, so yeah. But I think again, in in this, I wanting to demystify objectivity. There is no duty that God or the heavens have handed down. Thou shalt be objective. When it's appropriate to be objective, it is so for a reason, for a practical reason because that's going to help me make the best decision of who to promote, who to admit to the school, whether we should use that drug, right? I'm just trying to buy a car. I'm not dealing with other people. All right. I need to pay attention to my income, my resources, my needs, what I'm going to use it for, right? Because that's why I want to make a good decision about which car to buy. So yes, in the sense that it will be – relative to purpose or function. Well, that's – so that gets us to the question of when we're talking about the if-then of the of the government, of the state, it's, it's inexorably tied to what judges should do when they review the laws of the state. So, so can you talk a little bit about why in your view legal philosophy is inexorably related to political philosophy? Sure. And let me make one further – bridge connection here because I think this is sort of I think very – on your part, yeah, great great bridge from the purpose, the function. We we're just talking about the goal and that's really important to objectivity and this is why I think we need to think about objectivity. It's part of why I think we need to think about objectivity for a legal system and for judicial review more specifically because the function of the legal system or the purpose or the goal of the legal system is what's going to help guide us in figuring out how should we set up a proper legal system and then how within that should judicial review be uh, be conceived and be conducted, right? So again, even in this big legal realm, goal, function is going to be really important and that's something I think – that it's been very helpful for me in my own thinking about these issues to keep coming back to what's the function here? What's the role of government, right? So so now, Trevor, to get more directly to your question, um, I think – and I should say I'm not a lawyer. I don't have legal training. I'm a philosopher. OK. But from all of the hard thinking and reading that I've done about legal philosophy in recent years, I don't see a way that you can detach it from – at least basic questions and having some answers, you know, your answers to basic questions about the basic role of government, which I th- think of as more a political philosophy question. But why have government? What's it for? What's its justification, its authority? And then I think from there, it will make sense, at least according to if the answers are certain things to those questions, it's going to make sense to have a legal system, but that should be informed by what it's trying – what the government as a whole is trying to do. So I see a legal system as the more practical implementation of the answers to certain at least of the basic questions about the purpose and role and authority of government. Well, you're you're very attuned to the moral component of this because uh, as you write in the book, uh, we cannot know what a legal system should rule or how it should rule in order to rule objectively unless we securely understand that it should rule and why, the ground on which it may rightfully wield its tremendous power. And you, you mentioned consistently in the book that we need to remember that the government is force and it uses power and violence against people and mostly you're not allowed to do that. So you need a good reason and I think the way you're thinking about law is that if, if it doesn't do this according to law, then it is just force. That's all it is. It's just violence. Yeah. If it's right. I mean when you're making laws, if you're doing so informed by your sense of the right fu- – the proper function of government, right, then those laws are just further means of serving that function. But once any organ of the government, of the legal system, starts acting beyond the law – you're basically acting without authority and you're not in any way furthering the mission of the uh, 
of the government. Of so the then system. does this mean that on the part of judges when they have a case in front of them and they need to rule on this that they should be aware of what is actually law because it aligns with these first principles of government and what isn't and so decide on the basis of whether – I guess decide on the basis of those first principles or is their job to take the law in the sense of like those rules written down by the legislature and objectively apply that? More the latter but the answer gets a little bit complicated here, OK? I don't think it is for judges in order for them to properly uphold the law to play legal philosopher. Now, I think it's a lot of fun to be a legal philosopher, right? But no, if you're going, you know, if you're putting the robes on, you're swearing to uphold the law, not what the law should be or your better idea of the way they should have implemented those political philosophical ideals or the answers to those political philosophy questions. I do think if we are to be governed by the law, if we are to have the rule of law, then courts like everybody in the legal system, everybody who works for the legal system and everybody governed in that society, we have to go by the law. And as I said, even if the founders, let's say, made some mistakes, until we go ahead and have the courage to amend the constitution or something, they have to go – judges should abide by what the law is even if they have some disagreements of it. And some of the criticisms that I raise in the book of some views of judicial and of proper judicial review are critical of views that I think would give judges too philosophical a power. I mean I'm all for judges recognizing the philosophy in the law. But they have to recognize the philosophy that is in the law, that is implicit in what was written down rather than project their own. Idea. So how does this mesh then with the, the notion of objectivity as we were talking about it before where if we, we institute the state in order to accomplish certain things, rights protection and so objectively then we need to approach looking at the law with those objectives in mind. Right. Okay. And, and so, if that's then then, what if the law as written right. runs counter directly? Then to we should the change the law. But but the, we have ways of changing the law, right? But, we have but the rule. judge should enforce it. In the, yes, okay. yes, I think so because I think otherwise we would be ruled by the judges. That and, seems interesting. And by their views, which may be sincere, conscientious, even correct. Well, seems, about what the law should be, right? But no, no, they swear to uphold the constitution, not their idea of a better constitution. Or yeah, so but, yeah, I think we've got to go by that. Aaron's kind of, kind of asking, and I, this was I, I was I was intending, but it doesn't matter the order here to get to this sure. question later we, after we did some more of the groundwork. But he's, uh -huh. and this is what this is a, a big question: the judgment at Nuremberg question, and uh, and it's interesting for for our listeners who don't know much about legal philosophy. Uh, Prior to Nazi Germany, which threw a lot of legal philosophy in disarray because prior to that, a thing called positivism had reigned which said that law was merely a rule backed by force from the state. Uh, there's a few different per, per, you know, permutations of that but that was basically it. And then when Nazi Germany came along, these things were technically legal mm -hmm. and the question of whether or not they were – there was a – higher moral power that made them illegal. But in Judgment at Nuremberg, you have this hor horribly difficult question of the judges who enforced the laws written to put people into camps and eventually murder them, were they doing their judicial role or were they doing something fundamentally immoral that they should have been held accountable for? Mm -hmm. Do you have a position on the Judgment at Nuremberg you know, question or am um, I just asking you the worst, hardest question you're, ever? You're asking <laughs> me one of those questions like, oh, I should have thought about this some more, more directly. So it's a Good question. That movie is also spectacular sense. for anyone who hasn't seen it. Yeah. Um, boy, OK. I'm a, anyway, I'm not sure exactly what to say here. There – again, the way I've been talking about the function of a legal system, we have to try to figure out what is the proper function of a legal system, proper role of government and proper authority of government. Um, when an entire legal system is premised on really mistaken – and or evil uh, principles, right, right? I mean, well, they didn't have the right answers to the political philosophy questions. Therefore, they didn't set up a legal system that was consonant with that. Therefore, that's – in a sense, that's not what I'm talking about, right? I'm talking about in a way going back to the drawing board and thinking 
What should a government – and again, some of this is the role for philosophers, not courts, OK? But originally, why have a government? We need to have out those political philosophy arguments to figure out what's the role of government, what's its authority, what's it not to be doing, you know, at least by implication, and then set up a, you know, a system consonant with that, consistent in every way in terms of what the laws are, how they are administered, who they're administered to, not, oh, well, Aryan race, you know different rules for different folks, right? So the whole system there was fundamentally corrupt. But we obviously we have tried to learn some lessons from what similarities there are. But um, I do – and again, this in a way speaks to why I think the legal philosophy has to at least appreciate the important guiding role of answers in political philosophy. Now we talk about you have three corner. I want to get sort of back into some of the meat sure. here, so we so we can construct this groundwork with, with uh, uh, one chapter of your of your book is three cornerstones of objectivity in a legal system, mm. uh, which mm -hmm. some of these we've been talking about, mm -hmm. but I think we mm -hmm. should clarify. So you have a what, how, and a why, because yeah. there's many different. There's also there's written laws, where there's administration of those laws. And all. So so what is the what of the yeah. cornerstone? No, and I do think this is a again. I found it helpful just in my own thinking about judicial review and law in general. So as I, you know, early in the book I talk about what is objectivity. Then, okay, what's objectivity in a legal system? Now, you could write a whole book just on that, but in a chapter, I give this three-part analysis where I say basically what it comes down to or what it's the three pivotal aspects of propriety, objectivity in a legal system or what it does, by which I primarily mean the content of its laws, of its rules, be they the do's and don'ts directed to citizens or the do's and don'ts of what we, the legislative branch, may do, must do, may not do and so on. But it's basically the content of the rules is the what. In that sense, it, the what maybe is the simplest. Objectivity also turns on how a legal system does what it does, how it enacts its rules. How does it choose them? Is it just, you know, the so you know the dictator would be dictates or you know how will we enact laws how will we change laws um, how will we enforce them who will the person there are you know once you start thinking about it there are scores of simply sort of mechanical questions about how will this all be administered how will we change laws from time to time um, things like the rules of evidence when you get to court when do you get to court when am I entitled to bring somebody into court you know all of that is crucial to the objectivity of a system in part because even if you've got really good answers on that first facet of a legal system, what the rules are, you've written great rules, you've got a great constitution there, really objective, really objective laws, statutes. But if you mess up the administration of them, they're not going to do their job. Right? And again, you have to have that job, the function in mind. So what the legal system does, how it does it, which encompasses a great deal in the administration. It's not the sexy stuff but the day-to-day. -day, OK. But then also why it does what it does and by that I really mean the authority of law. What gives the government the power in the first place? What is its reason for being? And again, this brings us back to function and that I think has got to really help us answer the question of what kinds of laws should we enact? And how should we enact them, enforce them, administer them such that they are all together in tandem serving the function of government? Why, why does the law have any authority? Or when, why does the law have any authority or when can the law have authority? Well, now that's a different book. That's, but, I, no, I'm you, happy you, to talk you, about you, that. But yeah. you know, but you do but, talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Right? I mean it's important uh, because it, if, if, if the laws are you – know, I think maybe I, I, I got from your book that – if the laws are, um, let's say, the law and Fuller characteris characteristics, uh, oh, law, law, Fuller. so Lon Fuller wrote a book, Some, yeah. The Morality of Law, where he lists he t he thinks about a king named Rex who just giving away commands that are that are bizarre. They they make things illegal in the past. That they sounds so specific. foreign. That sounds yeah, so exactly. foreign. Yeah, exactly. I've never heard of it. Right, that they make things illegal in the past. Rex, is that it, the yeah. name of the guy? Oh. And they and they uh, and they make things illegal on a specific date. And they and have all these yeah. characters. They're contradictory. All these arbitrary. They're, so yeah, yeah, so yeah. He, he gives eight characteristics. Law, like real laws can't be contradictory. They can't be like it, private, it, private secret, all these kind right. of things. Yeah. Um, and, and so in that situation, would those laws have any moral authority? I mean would there be a why to the objectivity of law or would you be free to just break them 
Okay. With, with yeah. Just as no, much I don't as you think want. I don't think that sort of the model sort of the the model of Fuller that you were just now talking about the sort of antithesis of what we have come to think of as the rule of law and the elemental conditions that, for having a rule of law society. No, that would not have any claim on me, any purchase on me. So again, the author what I'm calling the authority of law is again a reflection of how this stems from a view of the purpose of government. And even that more deeply, I think, ultimately is going to be grounded in certain moral values. But again, coming back to something that you mentioned earlier, Trevor, um, government is coercion, right? It's for, we've got to keep in mind what are we talking about when we're talking about legal power, the power to make people do things whether or not they want to. I think that's a legitimate power for very limited purposes to keep you, Trevor, from picking Aaron's pocket. You know, from infringing on his rights. So the authority of government comes from its being dedicated, you know, doing the best job it can to fulfill its reason for being. What gave it its authority in the first place is you, government, you fulfill this function, protect our rights. So that again will serve – and you know, when I say that will serve to guide us, that doesn't mean that answers all questions and the waters part and that there aren't some hard, difficult arguments to be had about exactly how the legal system should do certain of these things. But I think that function does provide the compass by which we can figure out so then your authority will only extend this far government and that should inform the what and the how of the legal system. So again, you've got those three facets. So if government is most of what it does is force, right? And but it's okay when it forces people to do things that align with this goal of rights protection or whatever its particular telos was. Um, then what makes it different from me? Because I could say, you know, it's rather than being a research fellow at the Cato Institute, my new purpose is to protect the rights of everyone. You're sort of Robin Hood for rights, or right? Something like I was that. thinking I Batman. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Batman! You know, yeah, but like, yeah. If Batman you know Aaron, seems that's be, hilarious. By the way, <laughs> Batman seems to be, let's say, a non-state. Right, like he, we wouldn't, we wouldn't say he's enforcing the law. No. He's enforcing, but he. You say that to Batman, and, and yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. But, but he's maybe Judge Dredd would be a better. He's one. just <laughs> right, like he's we. Right. we could stipulate sure. that. Yeah, um, and so, okay. so how? But we wouldn't let him go around doing the things that we let government do. And so, how do we get to that? How does how does government? Because so, it, I, so yeah. it's still it remains force when an individual enforces rights, but it's not force. Well, when government simply if does he it. unilaterally does it, or he does it, and it's not in the context of an immediate emergency to try to save his life. Or, sure. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, in all honesty, that's an issue I want to think more about. That is the real originating of legitimate government. But I will say this and I, you know, I do think it's important. I do think there's a difference between having an organization, an institution such as government whose dedicated purpose is – and it's understood by everybody to be – they're the ones who will protect rights. In order to do that, they will be justified in enacting those rules and, and enforcing them and holding everybody accountable to them that are designed to fulfill that mission. You as a private individual, Batman or you know, whomever, right? Um, I don't think you – I don't think you have uh, – yeah, actually I don't think you have the same authority that somebody or some institution does when it is there. Like, in order to protect everybody's rights, I may – I, we the government now, may have to impose some rules that you as an individual wouldn't be entitled to impose on your neighbors. But insofar as they're the ones whose job is to think about how are we going to govern? You know, a few hundred million people, or even obviously in much smaller communities, still uh, they're going to have to have the authority to do more than a private individual would be able to do. But it's still got to be governed by what it's doing is its you know its best effort to fulfill its mission and not overstep those bounds. When we're talking about the government as people, the, the, so one thing that kept popping in my head when you think about judicial review. Um, which we'll return to mm -hmm. more specifically. Mm -hmm. what, sure. But it, the question that struck me was whether or not – because we, we often talk about the government as some sort of you know, homogeneous or clump of 
you know, one thing as opposed to a bunch of different people working different jobs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And one of the really interesting questions that I don't think has been explored in legal philosophy a lot, but I think your book kind of touches on it, is discretion of different actors in the legal system because that discretion exists, for example, for police officers. Mm -hmm. And the question mm -hmm. of whether mm – -hmm. so a police officer yeah. may decide to not enforce – he might see a guy, a kid smoking marijuana on the street under the stoop yeah. and he might decide not to enforce that because he's almost doing a weird type of judicial review. He's like reviewed the law. He's reviewed the facts and he's decided he's not going to enforce it. He's going to say, I'm just going to tell your mom on you. And, and now we could argue that what the police officer is doing is against – the meaning and purpose of the state because he's supposed to be just enforcing all laws equally or it is putting a type of discretion in the system that he's not allowed to have uh, and he's – and so therefore his job is to enforce all the laws all the time. Uh, is that a kind of weird – do we have a philosophy of state actors and what they're supposed to do too in addition to judges who are reviewing the law? Yeah. No, that's, that's an interesting question. I don't have a theory of state actors but I think that you know, of this sort that answers this. But I, as usual, I have a few things to say. Um, and I do think the role uh, – there's probably scholarship out there that I'm not aware of on the proper role of discretion at different levels and layers by different agents of the legal system. And there should be because it's an – I think it's an important concept. And I think – I mean I think that a legal – an objective, properly functioning legal system needs some degrees of discretion for different people and it might you know, be at a police officer or a judge or a prosecuting attorney, right? Resources are limited anywhere. You know, whether, whether they're a lot or a little, they're always limited. You've got finite resources to put on whatever you know, the NYPD wants to focus on let's say this year or the prosecutors, how many cases you – know, they've, they've only got a staff of so many and so on. They're always going to have to be choices made. Discretion is one of those terms that's sometimes used in – as license for arbitrariness. No. There's, there's no room for arbitrariness in an objective legal system from anybody, you know, from the guy at the DMV or the police officer or the judge or whatever, right? So no, arbitrary, reckless, dis you know, for no good re for no reason that seems to have anything to do with the proper functioning of the legal system yeah that such cop would be derelict of duty but that you know the cop also has so many hours in a day and so now you know we'd want to know more about the specific sort of case you raise but i so i don't think the proper rule of law demands no discretion for any legal agents anywhere no, there are always going to have to be judgments made. And this is one of the things I stress even in – well, in regard to judicial review and courts. The best made laws, the best made principles, the best made – the best understanding of the proper methodology for judges doesn't answer all the questions. Judgment is needed from human beings, individuals as you say. There isn't just this monolith government. No, it's this judge. It's that attorney and that prosecuting law, right? They've got to use their honest, objective judgment to be faithful to the law in doing you know, a good, responsible job of fulfilling their specific responsibilities in the legal system and that's going to involve some discretion. But it w I mean I do think more work – and again, I'm sure there's a lot of work out there that I just am not aware of. But it's an important topic because it's one where again a lot of people think, oh, discretion, you see, game over. It's all bias. It's all personal connection. It's, it does not have to be. It's sometimes that, sure. Sometimes people abuse their discretion, but it can be used responsibly and objectively. I you brought say. up the rule of law, which is which kind of, as you said, all this stuff touches on it, including the discretion of state actors. But you call the rule of law a moral ideal in, in the book. Why is the yeah. rule of law? Because sometimes I think that the rule of law might be overrated. I don't want laws that you – know. so as a redhead, if they made a law that cut off every redhead's hand, I hope that that law is not administered equally. I would really hope it's not and, and people who don't, sure. it's not like a good idea. So, but that's so, because it's a crummy law. Yeah, but right. so, so would it have to – does it have to have a substantive content? So when and how is the mor rule yeah. of law a moral ideal? Yeah, no, that – again, really interesting question and I think most people – not all by any means but most scholars of the rule of law think of the rule of law as amoral, that, you know, not immoral but not, not morally charged that, but morally neutral, 
value neutral. And this is something that a lot of people like about it. And as the rule of law has really been touted more and more uh, throughout the world in the last 20 or 30 years, as you've got, you know, the IMF or the all sorts of global economic fund, you know, all we hear about is rule of law. If you, as long as your laws are clear, as long as your laws are promulgated and mutually consistent, not ex post facto, et cetera, there are, you know, seven or eight mm -hmm. or nine conditions, people think then everybody can have the rule of law and it doesn't matter if you're a theocracy or a democracy or you're libertarian or egalitarian or what have you, right? So that's a very dominant model. Now, again, it's not everybody thinks that but a lot, most people do and I very much think that's a mistake and I think it's an important mistake. Uh, I do go into this in the book but just to say a little bit now, I don't think you could even figure out what the proper f so-called formal – non-value oriented, what the formal conditions would be without presupposing, without relying on some ideas of the kinds of laws we should and shouldn't have or the kinds of purposes for which laws shouldn't be used. Let me just give maybe one example to try to beef that up a little bit. Why not have ex post facto laws? If I'm a theocracy, you know, I'm running a theocracy, right? And I get a sudden revelation that those laws that have been in place for a long, long time and everybody's thoroughly accustomed to and so on, oh my god, you know, like they are an affront to the you know to our God, and God isn't giving me you know time to change this. Why shouldn't you know that ex post facto tough luck right so I th but again, it's just a quick indicator of depending on what your larger ideals are, they're actually going to color what seem to be reasonable formal conditions. And let me also bring this back to the purpose of government and the nature of government is coercive. When we talk about the rule of law, we're talking about how the laws will be made and enforced, enforced literally, right? We're talking about something moral, right? If we think it's wrong to use force against people unless, you know, they're initiating the use of force against somebody else, right? If we, th if we think there's a wrong there, if we think that government power, government co coercion may only be legitimately used on certain grounds, then that's got to inform even our understanding of what's essential to truly have the rule of law as opposed to the very orderly rule of thugs, Right? The completely predictable and trains run on time rule of dictators. That's not the rule of law. Right? It's a look-alike in some ways but don't be – you know, my preaching to some would be don't be confused by the appearance. But are those categorically different? If we, if we – so thugs, I guess that presupposes – As soon as I use that word, oh god. No, no. I mean no. no it, just, it presupposes some – a negative moral capability but we can imagine the enlightened dictator who promulgated rules uh, arbitrarily himself – uh, but they were always uh, morally just. Uh, he, I mean, he, he had no uh, good reasons for doing that. Apart from the fact that he's a dictator. That. Yeah, well, he, I mean, but he doesn't. He just, Details. He, he he only enforces his will, and uh, so. But he, he there's no democracy. There's no rule. It's it, it, it's unpredictable. But it just it, on some sort of basic level. But it just always happens to align with pre-existing moral precepts, as opposed to another system that has written laws and all these sort of things that obey the rule of law in some sort of sense, but is less just. Should we prefer a rule of law society, or am I asking, is the question not make sense, or are they? So we um, prefer a rule of law to die over a dictator even if the dictator is more just. I'm not sure I fully get the compare. I don't think it's – well, I don't think either of them is what you would want. At least if I'm understanding the scenario, the two alternatives as you're painting them out, um, to the extent that the just guy is a dictator, you know, just as he might be wise, reflective, smart, even getting a lot of – right, to the extent though that he's taking – you know, it, and we have to go into exactly what we mean by dictator yeah. here, right? But if he's taking freedom that is not his away from the people, that's not a proper legal system. So that's not the rule of law. That's the rule of his very well-intentioned, reflective ideals, right? And I think something similar would go for the alternative. I got a yeah, fuzzy. I yeah. think I think that's true. I was just because I, you you at one point you get into. Uh, I mean, the moral premises are very important in your book, and that and I think one of the reasons for a lot of Ernie's questions in this is that. I mean, Rand is very influential on you in, in your book, and you say it all the time. But the mm -hmm. interesting thing is, is why, why is anarchy not okay here, or why why do we have to sort of 
follow ourselves into this role that the state is, has to be there. And Aaron's question about Batman was actually the same as Roy Child's question about uh, who's going to if, – if a competing security agency oh. comes in and enforces things in a more just way, then does the government have to uh, – this whole question about moral authority. But you get to the five premises for moral and political foundations beneath the law's moral authority, which I think is your answer to this question if I may be so – like the, 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 there are certain things that the legal system has to do to respect – individuals and the rights of individuals that they have. Yes. I mean I, I do have a chapter going into the moral authority beneath the law and again it's a kind of bridge from answers to certain political philosophy questions to then the propriety of, of a, a legal system and legal authority. But yes, I mean I sketch – I sketch – the idea of individual rights because of individual needs for reason and freedom as a precondition uh, to be able to exercise that reason and but that's what take makes, that's what makes the state if the state does that it's just but if it doesn't do that it's unjust yes insofar as the purpose of government I think is to protect individual rights and these rights are grounded in our nature in a sense in a sense which I try to unpack and explain somewhat in the book. But yeah, but that but that's why the question. Let's get into the judicial review now in the role of judges. Uh, if it's the moral authority behind the state that gives it legitimacy and not the state qua the state, then when judges are doing review, should they just not enforce laws that con that contradict those yeah. moral principles? And no, that was one of Aaron's first yes, questions yeah. too. No, very much, pretty much the same question. Yeah, in different, exactly. Yeah, but but no, it's a good question. But I th but here again. No, I think courts, judges have to uphold the law as we have made it, even if we've made some mistakes in the making of it, mistakes vis-a-vis -vis those deeper moral principles. Because to even have a legal system is to say we can't go directly from conclusions of political philosophy to cop, draw your gun. Now, you know, that's a graphic way of putting it, but we need the intermediary layer, so to speak, of a legal system. With all that that entails, with, OK, we're going to have rules. We're not just going to, oh, I know the answers from philosophy seminar. So Trevor, you're under arrest mm -hmm. or we're declaring war on you, Cuba or what. It's like, no, if we're going to govern large numbers of people and govern them in, you know, in an organized way that is most conducive to our actually protecting their rights, we're going to have to have rules that everybody can know in advance such that – I mean the point of having the rules – is so that people know if you abide by these, you're basically respecting other people's rights and then we, the government, don't have to get involved. So I mean there's also just what, – what the law communicates is not simply when will I go to jail or be fined but the kinds of behaviors that are necessary for me to actually be and for us all to enjoy the benefits of living in a society in which we are respecting one another's rights. But because it's not self-evident, oh – you know, government should protect rights. Therefore, he should be arrested. You should stop that kid on the block and so on. We need this intermediate layer and then if we're to be governed by that as I think we should be, we have to be, um, courts should go by the law as it is. They can express their reservations about what the – I mean actually maybe they shouldn't do that from the court. But um, you know, they can vote for who they want to when they go to the ballot box. But if, if they think some people would change laws that they think need to be changed, but they're there to uphold the law, not their idea of a better law, even if I might agree with their idea of what the better law would be. I mean there are laws that I don't like but I think the government's got to enforce them and I, I you know, rue the government when it doesn't do that because that's a much – I mean much more dangerous I think in the long run to it's have – It's arbitrary. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's pick and choose. It's you – know. So how does your theory of judicial review – how is it different from – the other – I mean there's many competing theories of judicial mm. review and so maybe can you just contrast it with say Some, originalism or living constitution, some of the other ones our listeners may have yeah. heard of. OK. Sure. Um, let me – OK. Briefly on living constitutionalism but then I will come back to originalism. Uh, Living constitutionalism, though we haven't used that term, has actually come up in some of what we've been talking about, particularly the few times that I've said – Judges have to go by what the law is, not what they think it should be. Whereas some of the advocates, many of the advocates of living constitutionalism, which takes in a lot of different views, but I'm thinking of a Ronald Dworkin theory or the aspirationalist views of a contemporary would be uh, Jim Fleming, 
love Jim Fleming. He's a great guy. But I completely disagree with him on this. Um, they'll speak of realizing our best ideals, which is a lovely idea. But I think not for the court to engage in. If we want, you know, if we as a society want think we haven't done justice to the ideal of equality or the ideal of liberty or whatever it might be, then it's for us to make some changes in the legal system. But it is not for the courts, again, even when they are the smartest, best intended and so on. No, they are to uphold the constitution, not their idea of a better constitution. Originalism is – take a deep breath here. You know, when I started out working on this whole subject about nine or ten years ago, I just thought, oh, yeah, how should judges interpret the law? And I thought I might spend a semester and maybe do an article and, and – but it, it quickly evolved. Yeah, because I found the question complicated. Um, I found the people I was discussing it with really interesting and I learned so much. I have to say from people in legal academia, learned tremendously. Um, and even while all of my first instincts were originalist and I definitely share the opposition that they voice to many of the alternative views, living constitutionalism, popular constitutionalism, some other views as well. Um, in the end, what I've come to think is the originalist makes a really important mistake that's as subjectivist as the views that they oppose. And one of the things I try to do in the book is distinguish the original from the objective because I think – and I, obviously there are different species of originalism and there are I think cruder and much more sophisticated species from originalism and here too. I've learned a lot from really smart originalists. I've learned a lot from them. Um, but I, for all I've seen so far, I do think they – and I'm speaking broadly here, but I think they fall into this trap of equating – Objective meaning, the obje what's the objective law with what was originally thought about something and it locks us into the mindsets of certain people and gives those people more authority than they really have and mistakes the actual objective meaning of the law. Now again, I go into that in much somewhat technical detail but I think very followable by a layman in, in the book. But yeah, I, so I, just, I really want to distinguish – what I think is objective understanding and objective meaning from original meaning. So let's uh, uh, apply one of these to get an uh, uh, answer. So probably the most originalist heavy Supreme Court decision in the last 10 years is Heller versus District of Columbia, which is just a cavalcade of originalism on Scalia's majority opinion versus Stevens' minority opinion uh, to interpret the Second Amendment. Now, what – would an objective judicial review do when they look at the Second Amendment, uh, the right of people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed uh, with the predicate – with the, yeah. the predicative um, element of in order to assure the security of a free state um, and versus how the originalists did it? I don't know. Um, I hate to say that but you know Gun, the gun issue, the Second Amendment is not one that I've been that interested in, so I've neglected it. And well, okay, meaning, well, that's uh, yeah. a bad example. We could choose yeah, well, a different one. Okay, I mean, I've, I thought your answer would be something about like looking at the right of self defense before the right, the words in the Constitution. And it might even that might even be my answer, but I'd want to think about it a mm -hmm. little bit more. But that's one that I, I just yeah. So I mean, what, what's equal it, protection maybe or uh, yeah one of those that, that where an originalist would decide one way but maybe well I, yeah I, yeah I mean so do why don't we way. why don't we say equal a few words about yeah. equal protection Fourteenth Amendment equal protection right um, and that's been in the news somewhat recently when you think about the dispute about religious exemptions for instance. First Her Amendment, Hobby Lobby. free exercise of religion, Hobby Lobby, right? Little sisters and, of the poor. No, I mean so whether it be in regard to uh, the Affordable Care Act and religious institutions, be they private or well, private, you know, religious universities or Little Sisters of the Poor, or a Hobby Lobby, a private business, right? Having to fulfill the equal protection requirements of employment law and non-discrimination by giving certain sorts of insurance to all their employees, or the religious free. Or we seem to have a conflict there. We can come back to the conflict issue even separately if we want in a bit, but. Um, when we think about equal protection, 
Uh, I'm sorry. I was going to say the other thing it arises recently conspicuously in regard to is gay marriage. Yeah. Right, and this religious business doesn't want to make the wedding cake. Sorry, right. So again, we seem to have a conflict out of that. But it's well, what what does equal protection mean? When the Fourteenth Amendment was enacted, right, they had in mind the people who enacted it, and most people in society at that time had certain ideas of who it applied to and in what ways. And women having the vote? No, that wasn't on their minds in 1865 for the most part, right? Gays getting married? Are you, lunatic. I wasn't thinking that 15 years ago. Are you kidding, right? So, well, the originalist, I think, and you know, there may be an originalist who will correct me on this, but as far as I can understand, even the public understanding originalist will say, we have to go by the meaning of the law, which was what the public understanding was at the time it was enacted. I'm saying, no, we have to go by what equal protection means. And that means, you know, that uh, I'm thinking of Loving v. Uh, Virginia or whatever it was. Right? I mean, no, those people, the black and the white, equal protection means they get to get married and the woman gets the vote, right? And yeah, the gays get to get married too if this is how you're going to, uh, you know, legally award benefits to marriage and so on. So that's just an example of how I think the understanding at a certain time they weren't thinking blacks education together, right? I mean, so it they had a certain conception of who who equal protection protected and in what ways, and they didn't have in mind uh, integrated ed education. But if we've later come to think, no, no, equal protection really means this or really encompasses this, then that is the kind of thing the objective theory of law would say we've got to do. And that's what. That's what a, an objective a judicial opinion would basically write this in the same. We try to figure out what is equal arbitrary. protection. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, you know, there there are so many asterisks or footnotes, at least clarifications, I guess you might put on this. The sheer fact that we today think equal protection means thus and such, that doesn't mean we're right, right? I'm not. I don't want to elevate today. Well, this is today's opinion or today's consensus as if there were a consensus, right? But to the extent that we can say, well, most people today think this versus what most people thought in 1865 or whatever. I don't want to in effect privilege the contemporary over the historical because we might be you – know, I mean we may be further – but to the extent we have followed objective methods and that will vary on different issues, right? But to the extent we have engaged in truly objective thought, then we're in a position to say, oh, no, equal protection means this. That was a mistake. Those people need to be allowed to marry one another or you know, to vote or what have you. So anyway, that's one. So what sort of characteristics should we be looking for in judges when they're appointed – uh, to the Supreme Court or circuit courts. Maybe they're different at yeah. different levels. Okay. What should, is voters as, as informed people the next uh, Supreme Court position that comes up if, if Tara Smith was was there to say these are the, the judges who should be uh, raised to the, to the highest court in the land? What, what sort of characteristics Boy, should we be looking for? That's an interesting question that you can you can take on a few levels and there are a few different kinds of responses um, I, I want to give. I think I've got three different kinds of responses. So let me quickly try to say a little bit about each of them. One thing I want to say is, you know, judicial review is hard work and I think sometimes we underestimate that, certainly in popular debate but even sometimes in scholarly discussion of these issues but much more so I think in popular debate which gets heated when they're, you know, presidential election and some older members of the court and so on and likely vacancies and so on. Um, it's very difficult, abstract work to be objective in figuring out was that a search? You know, did that when the police stopped that guy, did that really constitute you know a reasonable search, or did they have reasonable grounds? Or um, uh, I mean, think about free press, right? Well, freedom of the press does that encompass the freedom to not divulge your sources in the course of an important government investigation? The answers to these are complicated. And that doesn't mean there are no answers but it means it's going to take some pretty sophisticated work. So even – well, I think voters to the extent they're thinking about the kinds of people we should want on the courts, they have to appreciate that you need both real – you need from members of all of the high courts, right? Real knowledge of the law. 
of the history of the law, of why the different laws are there because one of the things I stress in the book is the philosophical character of the law and you do want judges to understand and respect that philosophical context in trying to make out the meaning of any particular provision. Okay? So you're going to need people who have a good command of the law, its philosophy, its history, the existing you know, rules and all of that. Intellectual – I will say and I talk a little bit about this in the book. I think there are two main characteristics that you need to look for. Intellectually, they need to be really skilled conceptual thinkers who can think in principle, who are good at distinguishing the peripheral from the essential on issues because a court is continually – faced with the question, so is this a violation of Fourth Amendment? Is this a violation of let's say the gun rights, you know, the Second Amendment, you know, is this equal protection? And the answers are hard. So you're gonna need people who are really good at, at separating the extraneous from the core. Okay. You're gonna need people with a moral character of integrity. And much as we rail against the judicial activist and you know they're just making the law and inserting the law and that certainly happens and that certainly needs to be condemned. That is wrong. You don't want – you don't – as we've said about five times today, right? You don't want people impo – uh, judges imposing their views. You also want judges who have the courage to live up to the constitution's convictions and assert themselves and not simply defer – and here I think the people at the Institute for Justice are doing very good work when they champion what they call judicial engagement. Yeah, the judge – you know, you swear your oath of office is you'll uphold the constitution as much or as little as that is. But it is absolutely irrelevant that most people today want the law to be such and such that this decision would be unpopular or socially – that's the, socially divisive. That's beside the point. The law is the point and it's going to take courage because they're going to take a lot of flack sometimes for uh, you know, turning down things that the Congress and the president have enacted or have done. But the blame then is on those other branches for not – OK. The other thing I do want to mention is you know, there was a really – I thought a very good piece written a few months ago by Randy Barnett and uh, Josh, Josh Blackman. Blackman in the Weekly Standard, which you could get online, and it was directly on this question of what should we look for in a. And I thought they, I, I thought it was a very good piece, and I agreed, with, you know, just about everything in it. Uh, I might have had a few smallish, but I mean, and one of the good things they said was, you know, don't folk when we have these Senate hearings, confirmation hearings, and so on, don't ask about specific cases. Ask about are you willing in principle to overturn precedent, right? And ask about clauses of the Constitution and what do you think that means and try to draw them out on that. And I thought that was the right-minded approach because it's a more fundamental, more principled, more philosophical approach. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.